So there I was, in a state of serene recollection, pondering questions of heavy import, ruminating on deep mysteries. This is often the case on a Sunday afternoon. When suddenly, <laughs> who could be calling at this hour? I look at the phone and see a name I don't recognize. It looks like one of those old Puritan names, like Redemption Smith or Providence Jones. Do I answer? Senior Aeneas, Ted speaking. Hello, friend. Hello? Let me introduce myself, if I may. My name is Potential. Potential Spom. Hi, Potential. I should like to ask you a question. Shoot. Are you saved? Am I saved? The man asks. My mind is reeling. My thoughts all come to me in a jumble. The first thought. We did a whole video on that. This guy clearly hasn't subscribed to our YouTube channel. But then, a lot of our viewers haven't subscribed yet. My second thought. Are we doing this right now? You're darn right we're doing this. Funny you should ask that potential. As a matter of fact, I was saved. Titus 3.5. And I'm being saved. 1 Peter 3.21. And I will be saved. Romans 6.8. Having been born again by water and the Spirit. John 3.3 3, and following at my efficacious, regenerative infant baptism. Boom. Hello, Ted. Are you there? Oh, shoot. Yep. Well, friend, I confess I'm more than a little perturbed at what I am hearing. You don't really suppose that your having been sprinkled with water as an infant was sufficient to purchase for you the rewards of eternal life. Why, it's funny. I was just reading an article on infant baptism, in particular the arguments of one Tertullian of Carthage, whom I have seen heralded as the first Baptist theologian. Breathe, Ted. In fact, I can read you what he said about it, if you care to hear. Sure, potential. <clears throat> oh, I presume you're using uh, Evans's translation? Well, of course. I find his treatment of the Latin to be superior in most respects to Thelwall and Souter. This guy's good. I'm reading here from De Baptismo, chapter 18. Uh, you, you don't mind if I just give the English? Yeah, 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 that's fine. Good. <clears throat> it follows that deferment of baptism is more profitable, in accordance with each person's character and attitude, and even age, and especially so as regards children. For what need is there... There really is no need for even their sponsors to be brought into peril. And so on. Let me skip ahead here. It is true, our Lord says, forbid them not to come to me, Matthew nineteen fourteen. So let them come. When they are growing up, when they are learning, when they are being taught what they are coming to, let them be made Christians when they have become competent to know Christ. Now, I don't think I could put that better myself. Clearly, Brother Tertullian here holds to a believer's baptism. Now, do you know when this treatise was written? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait a minute. What does he say after that? I mean, the treatise does go on. But the salient point here is that why should innocent infancy come with haste to the remission of sins? Isn't that what he says? I mean, the sentence right after you stopped reading. Well, well, yes, it does appear. It doesn't really sound like the kind of thing a Baptist theologian would say. In fact, it kind of sounds like baptismal regeneration. Oh, 
And a bit later, he says, with no less reason, ought the unmarried also to be delayed until they either marry or are firmly established in continence. So Tertullian's whole argument here is that since baptism is what forgives your sins, you should delay baptism until you're ready to stop sinning. Well, now, now that does not exactly follow. I know, right? It doesn't at all follow. Because we know that if after baptism you commit a sin, you just go to confession and get your sins off that way. But remember, Tertullian believed that the sacrament of penance could be administered only once. Now, I want to focus on the fact that the man disagrees with infant baptism. And might I add, he's writing this about the year 200 AD. This is the practice of the ancient church. Listen, just listen to what he says. Let them come to me when they are growing up, when they are learning, when they are being taught what they are coming to. I wonder how many Catholics he's taken in with this. Isn't it interesting that Tertullian needs to make an argument for infant baptism? I beg your pardon? Why make the argument in the first place? The way Tertullian talks about it, it sounds like infant baptism is the established practice there in North Africa, and he's advancing arguments for them to stop doing what they've been doing. <laughs> it's preposterous. And what about that clause you read earlier? What need is there if there really is no need? What does that mean? Uh, it's a good question. Well, it sounds like if there really were a need, like, say, if the infant were in danger of dying, then Tertullian would be in favor of administering baptism. Now, you're just grasping at straws here. The man has firmly stated his position against infant baptism. Yes, but only if there really is no need. Si non tam necesse est. That's a conditional clause. So according to Tertullian, if there really is no need then delay baptism. But what if there is a need? Like, what if your baby is sick? Ted, why are you conjuring up these poor ailing infants when Tertullian betrays no awareness of any such practice as baptizing sick babies? Potential, are you familiar with the work of Ernst Deal on early Christian epigraphy? Ah, Inscriptiones Latinae Christiane Veteris, Ancient Latin Christian Inscriptions, three volumes, 1924 to 1931. It does seem to ring a bell. Deal's inscription number 1611C is from the catacombs of Pontianus in Rome. Actually, Joachim Jeremias dates this to about the time of Tertullian's De Baptismo, although that's tendentious. And it reads, For Eutychianus, sweetest son, Eutychus' father has dedicated, lived one year, two months, four days, servant of God, Iota Cairo, Ichthus. What is your point here? Well, obviously, this 14-month-old child fell ill, and so they had him baptized. Where does it say that exactly? It calls him a servant of God. Well, we may presume that he was, after going to be with the Lord. Well, amen. But that last line, ichthus, well, means fish. But did you know that in the early church, it was an acronym for Jesus Christos Deu Huias Soter, Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior? Everyone knows that. Ah, but do you remember what Tertullian does with the word ichthus? In chapter one of De Baptismo, he writes, but we being little fishes, as Jesus Christ is our great fish, capital F in Evans, we begin our life in the water and only while we abide in the water are we safe and sound. Ted, you do recall Tertullian is writing in Latin, whereas ichthus is fish in Greek. No, Tertullian uses Greek letters for fish. Check your Evans. So he does. Ichthus is baptismal language. You're stretching the evidence. It seems to me more likely that Ichthus in the inscription is a symbol of Christ, not of baptism. I'm afraid you're all wet on this one. <laughs> Potential, you rogue. <laughs> uh, all right, maybe this one's inconclusive. But what about inscription number 1531? Sweet Tyche lived one year, 10 months, 15 days, received grace the eighth day before the Calends, gave up her soul on the day written above. Now, the grace here is supplied, but the inscription clearly says, Ekchepit, what do you suppose this infant received on the day she died? Or the next inscription, 1532, Irene, who lived with her parents 11 months, six days, received grace seven days before the Ides of April, 
and gave up her spirit on the Ides of April. Both these inscriptions are from the catacombs of Priscilla in Rome, and they date to the 3rd century, Tertullian's Floruit. Clearly, these early Christians were baptizing infants. I admit that that can be construed that way. But, but don't despair. I know of at least one other ancient Christian who was in favor of delaying baptism. Really? Yeah, you read about it in the letters of St. Cyprian of Carthage. Which letter was that now? Letter 64. It's in the third volume of Clark's translation. I've just got the Antonicene Fathers here. Oh, interesting. Well, in your text, it's letter 58. This is a conciliar letter. 66 bishops, including Cyprian, had gathered at Carthage on the Ides of May in AD 252, and they've drafted a letter to an absent bishop by the name of Fidus to inform him of their decisions. Now, this bishop Fidus had argued in favor of delaying baptism. You don't say. So Cyprian writes, as far as concerns the case of infants, you, Fidus, expressed your view that the newly born should not be baptized and sanctified before the eighth day. See, Fetus wanted to delay baptism until the child was eight days old. So let's see what uh, Cyprian thought of that. Our council adopted an entirely different conclusion. No one agreed with your opinion on the matter. Instead, without exception, we all formed the judgment that it is not right to deny the mercy and grace of God to any man that is born. But seeing that the Lord says in his own gospel, the Son of Man has come not to destroy the souls of men, but to save them, Luke 9.56, we must do everything we possibly can to prevent the destruction of any soul. We need to ask, what can be lacking to one who has already been formed by the hands of God in his mother's womb? To our way of thinking, indeed, and to our eyes, infants after their birth appear to grow and increase as the earthly days go by, but as far as God their maker is concerned, whatever has been made by him is perfect and complete, thanks to his handiwork and almighty power. Then Cyprian makes a rather ingenious argument for the equal humanity of adults and children from Elisha's resuscitation of the child in 2 Kings chapter 4. Then he demonstrates how the practice of circumcising on the eighth day should not prevent Christian parents baptizing their child before that date. And then Cyprian comes to his peroration. Every man, without exception, has the right to be admitted to the grace of Christ. Since Peter, too, in the Acts of the Apostles, declares, The Lord has said to me that no man is to be called impure and unclean. Acts 10.28 Besides, if anything could stand in the way of obtaining grace... Hey, look at that. Obtaining grace. It's just like in the inscriptions. Moving on. If anything could stand in the way of obtaining grace, it would rather be adults, men of mature and more advanced years who might have their way blocked by their more grievous sins. But remember this. Even in the case of those who have sinned most grievously, offending many times in their past lives against God, they are granted remission of their sins subsequently on becoming believers. No one is denied access to baptism and grace. Baptism and grace? How about that? Anyway, how much less reason is there then for denying it to an infant, who, being newly born, can have committed no sins? The only thing he has done is that, being born after the flesh as a descendant of Adam, he has contracted from that first birth the ancient contagion of death, and he is admitted to receive remission of his sins all the more readily, in that what are being remitted to him are not his own sins, but another's. Potential, I've been reading your ear off here. Would you like to read through to the end of the letter from your translation? And therefore, dearest brother, this was our opinion in council, that by us no one ought to be hindered from baptism and from the grace of God, who is merciful and kind and loving to all, which since it is to be observed and maintained 
in respect of all we think is to be even more observed in respect of infants and newly born persons who on this very account deserve more from our help and from the divine mercy that immediately on the very beginning of their birth lamenting and weeping they do nothing else but entreat we bid you dearest brother ever hardly farewell isn't that cute cyprian says that when a baby's crying what he's really saying is baptize me baptize me <laughs> uh well, what would you make of it all well you're not gonna like this one bit but from where I'm standing, this Cyprian is writing here after the great apostasy had destroyed the purity of apostolic faith. Oh, potential. This letter was written all of 50 years after Tertullian wrote De Baptismo. Do you really think that at some point between AD 200 and 250, every single bishop in North Africa simultaneously invented infant baptism? There were 66 bishops at that council. 66 gray-haired men who, between them, had spent lifetimes in service to the church. And the sole dissenting voice is the guy who says you should wait to baptize a baby until it's eight days old. And everybody looked at him like, you're crazy, man. Why would you wait that long? These are the people who are in charge of doing baptisms. And every single one of them baptizes infants. What I see it's a group of ecclesiastical functionaries holding a church council. That's not apostolic Christianity for crying out loud. It's the Middle Ages. It's the year 252. It's the middle of the Roman Empire. And how can you say that church councils are medieval when you've got one already in Acts 15? Acts 15 was an assembly of spirit-filled, born-again Christians. Whereas this letter is nothing but a bunch of Catholic bishops. You know, it might interest you to hear some of Cyprian's testimony. You know, he was uh, an adult convert from paganism. I wasn't aware of that. Yeah, he talks about his conversion in one of his treatises. I believe it's actually printed as Epistle 1 in your translation. Epistle 1 to Donatus. Yeah, that's it. Check out Section 4. These were my frequent thoughts, for as I myself was held in bonds by the innumerable errors of my previous life, from which I did not believe that I could by possibility be delivered, so I was disposed to acquiesce in my clinging vices. And because I despaired of better things, I used to indulge my sins as if they were actually parts of me and indigenous to me. But after that, by the help of the water of new birth, the stain of former years had been washed away, and a light from above, serene and pure, had been infused into my reconciled heart. After that, by the agency of the Spirit breathed from heaven, a second birth had restored me to a new man. Huh. He knows how to talk like a Christian, but he doesn't act like one. His decision at that council... Uh, potential? What? You do know that Cyprian died a martyr, right? I, th I think I did. I think I did know that at one point. Yeah, and the church actually preserved the transcript of his trial. Really? Want me to read it to you? Go ahead. This is from the Acts of St. Cyprian, A.D. 258, beginning at chapter 3. The next day, September 14th, a huge crowd gathered in the morning at Sextus's estate, as the proconsul Galerius Maximus had ordered. The proconsul, Galerius Maximus, commanded Cyprian to be arraigned before him in the hall, which was called Sociolum. When the bishop Cyprian was brought in, the proconsul, Galerius Maximus asked him, Are you Thasius, also called Cyprian? The bishop Cyprian said, I am. 
the proconsul said, the most reverend emperors have ordered you to perform the religious rites. Cyprian responded, I will not. The proconsul Galerius Maximus said, mind yourself. Bishop Cyprian said, do as you have been ordered. In so just a matter, there is no need for deliberation. Galerius Maximus consulted with his advisory staff and then with difficulty and reluctance spoke as follows. You have long persisted in your sacrilegious views and you have joined to yourself many other vicious men in a conspiracy. You have set yourself up as an enemy of the gods of Rome and of our religious practices and the pious and venerable emperors Valerian and Gallienus Augusti and Valerian, the most noble of Caesars, have not been able to bring you back to the observance of their sacred rites. Thus, since you have been caught as the instigator and leader of a most atrocious crime, you will be an example for all those whom, in your wickedness, you have gathered to yourself. Discipline shall have its sanction in your blood. Then he read the decision from a tablet. Fascist Cyprian is sentenced to die by the sword. The Bishop Cyprian said, Thanks be to God. Wow. Those are his last recorded words. Deo gratias. Say, that's just like the end of... The end of what? Ah. Uh, the end of Mass? Potential. Were you raised Catholic? Now, now, I don't see what that's got to do with infant baptism. True enough. Sorry. Didn't mean to pry. In any event, I don't even think that Cyprian's is the best early church argument in favor of infant baptism. Is that the case? No, I think Origin of Alexandria's case is a lot stronger. Why don't you take down his commentary on Romans? Uh, it should be in the first volume. I don't believe I have that one. Oh, potential. The greatest theologian of the third century writes a commentary on St. Paul's greatest epistle. And you can't be bothered to pick up a copy? This is great stuff. Wait till you see what he says about predestination. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We're talking about infant baptism. Are you ready for this? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. I mean, Cyprian has already laid out a pretty sophisticated biblical and theological argument in favor of infant baptism. But we should expect a figure with the world-girding intellect of origin to positively dazzle us with his reasoning. Are you you're sure you're ready? I'm, I'm ready. All right. Here's the argument. The church has received the tradition from the apostles to give baptism even to little children. That's it. That's the argument. So what do you make of that? Potential? Potential?